Hey, this is Alex with Scopestack, and today um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an extended walkthrough about creating document templates for your Scopestack account. I'll just go ahead and say up front, this is going to require a little prerequisite knowledge about the platform, how it works. Um, if there are things that you're not familiar with that I'm talking about, um, feel free to reach out, but largely... Um, the information that I'm going to present is going to be for users who already kind of have a good working knowledge of how Scopestack thinks about the platform itself. Um, so today what I'm going to be talking about is how do you take uh, the information that's in the platform and apply it to a document template uh, to get the correct output that you're looking for. Um, <clears throat> the other thing um, that I'll kind of address up at the top here is we frequently get asked some version of the question, hey, can you tell me the exact way to get uh, my document template to do X or Y? Um, thinking that there's just a one-to-one, -one, you know, I've got a magic list of every uh, merge field that is available and how to give the exact um, right merge field. And it works a little bit more complexly than that. And I think a way that adds um, a lot of flexibility to uh, uh, allow us to be able to generate document templates of a wide variety of um, outputs. However, that just means there's a little bit more to kind of understand here. Um, another prerequisite thing would be that in order to use merge fields like this, you will need a copy of Microsoft Word. I know we've got some clients that use Google Docs and they may um, rely on the document template that we a uh, scope stack might have made at some point or they downloaded one of our standards um, <clears throat> sometimes we'll get questions about hey how do I edit that document template really um, you're gonna need Microsoft Word to edit that document template so today I'm gonna be using Word for Mac uh, 2022 um, and it's particulars uh, of how its ribbon works will obviously come into play but the same basic functions are in um, all of uh, the modern editions of Microsoft Word. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Obviously, I'm sitting here actually in our help center because I wanted to call attention to a few of the other resources uh, that are already here that I'm gonna refer to. First off is this link to common merge fields. Um, you'll see me reference this document in a bit. The common merge fields document is available for you to download um, using this little download button. And this gives you uh, basically our cheat sheet. I make live updates to this cheat sheet as well as other members of our team all the time um, that you can copy and paste out of this document into your document template. So we'll go a little bit more over how to use some of this um, in a bit, but I wanted to call this out uh, straight away here. One of the other resources that I wanted to mention as I uh, go back here to uh, this particular section is uh, the um, document templates that we have for use here. So under SOW and document templates for use, we have three principal uh, generic templates that we provide, a professional services only template. And of course, um, it talks about what language fields are there, uh, the managed services only template, and then a combo managed service professional services template. So I'll also uh, reference some of these as we go along. These get preloaded into all new accounts, so if you're still working in a new account, you likely already have these. However, I just wanted to show you in case you don't have those in your account. There's all sorts of other great resources in here um, about how you can use the platforms, uh, uh, excuse me, how you can use the platforms uh, information to create document templates, but those are a few good ones to start with um, as we get going. So, what is even a document template? So, I know I said a moment ago, this is already going to require some knowledge, but just the gist of it, right, where we're working. If I hop into the platform here, when I come in here to settings, and I come to this document section and document templates, these are the document templates that are present in this account. Today I'm working in a demo account. Um, that's preloaded uh, with our gold data as of the time of this recording. But really, at whatever time you are in a Scopestack account, even if it's different document templates, 
Um, you can see these are the templates that would be available um, in this account, and you would, of course, have the templates available in your account. These are different from the projects themselves. So I hopped back here using the projects button to my list of projects, and these projects here are going to be the individual uh, pieces of work that you're gonna be doing for clients. And, and I think a good key point to start with is all document templates have to have something to generate against. And that, in our case, is going to be a project. All the merge fields, everything we're gonna talk about as we go forward has to have something to generate against. So. Um, whenever I'm working on a document template for an account, I'm always working from a project. I need to know what source project I'm going to be working from because that also helps us ground um, what uh, we want to happen in uh, actual information in the platform. So for today's purposes, um, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to take a look at the standard um, professional services uh, template um, in this account. So that professional services template um, can be downloaded by clicking here and clicking the download current button. Um, when I do that, that's gonna pull up the template. Um, and this template has these merge fields in it. You can see prominently here at the top, the very first one that I can see is project name, but you can't guess what that one does. So this is a good moment for me to talk about what exactly is a merge field. A merge field is a type of a mail merge item. So you can see here, I've modified my ribbon uh, in Microsoft Word to put my field button right here. Um, in uh, normal uh, Word for Mac, you can find it under the insert ribbon, under insert here. I can go down to mail merge and I can select merge field. It's really important. All document uh, templates um, that are going to have items merged into them, uh, all of the syntax that we're going to go through has to be put in in the form of a merge field. So as you can see here, this is equals project name. I would put that into my document by typing equals project name. This UI. Um, looks a little different depending on um, your version of Word, but the principles behind it all kind of stay the same. So this actually, um, before we go further, how would you figure out for a specific project what the project name should be? Now, in this case, for a project name, that's pretty simple. If I go back to my platform and I click on uh, a project here, obviously the name of this project the project name is Manage Cloud and Security. How would I um, understand that that is what that um, project name should be? To do that, I can click on this View Merge Data button. Now, I've got this View Merge Data button available um, because I'm using an account that has a level of permission that allows me to view that. If you don't see that view merge data button, so if we go back to the uh, top of a project here, that view merge data button is only going to be available um, if you have that permission, right? How do you, uh, if you don't see it, how do you get it? You can come in here into settings, and of course this is going to require an account, um, a user account I should say, that has enough privilege to edit the roles. If I come down to roles, <coughs> I can come in to uh, see my different roles and I can search for project merge. See, yeah, projects, excuse me, merge data. So as you can see right here, and even in this account, the uh, projects merge data is set to none. So in this case, I would want to set that to view so that users with the admin role could see that merge data button. That's how you enable that. So if we go back into a project here and I click on the view merge data button, I'm going to see a lot of information. I'm actually probably gonna see more information than I would ever want to merge into a uh, document. There are all sorts of things in here, right? You can scroll. And this can feel very overwhelming, but really there's a few things that we really are gonna look for here. 
um, that are going to be very helpful. So to, to keep with what we were talking about here, the first is just simply how do you insert anything into a merge? Uh, how, if you've got something that you can see very clearly right here, how do you insert it into your document, right? I can do that by doing this equals project name. If I come in here to the merge data view and I search, I can do project underscore name. And there I can see it right there. Project name um, is network design and install. This is where a little bit of the back end code of the Scopestack platform bleeds in. Um, we work in Ruby on Rails um, for our database architecture. Um, and so a lot of the rules and nomenclature that I'm going to use are going to rely on that. So we would call this a key pair value. Your key here in this case is project name and the value is going to be um, the network design and install. So what I'm doing here with this equals is I'm saying equals uh, project name. In this case, that equal sign is telling the platform to actually insert something. You're going to see in a moment we've got circumstances where we wouldn't start off with an equals, but you can see pretty much everything on this cover page has an equal sign in front of us, which uh, would let me know that pretty much all of that is going to be available at the top level of the merge data. I can check that by doing some simple searches. I can do sales executive, right? So sales executive name, um, in this case would, uh, excuse me, that's one of it. And you can see as well, there's actually a different data object, right? So um, you can use our guide here to see, hey, here's some suggested ones, uh, some suggested easy ones that you can use in yours. But there's a lot of different information um, and some of it may be a little redundant based on the needs of specific clients over time and there's pros uh, there's uh, <clears throat> different circumstances of how you want to display information that lead our team to create different data objects so if i wanted to uh, check something else here let's say um i wanted to see about this pre-sales engineer i let off with sales executive which was kind of a bad example because that particular project doesn't have a sales executive but i can see pre-sales underscore engineer actually does and so you can see here, I can see that at the top level, I've got pre-sales engineer, and then under it, I've got name, title, email, and phone. This uh, line break and indention is actually indicating to me, and that's the reason that you see the dot name here, because what I'm saying is I want pre-sales engineer dot name and that dot is letting me say okay i want to actually go down to this name value and then print that so in this case my pre-sales engineer is sales executive not confusing at all it's what i get for using demo data but you can kind of get how that uh, correlates there if i come back to um my project here right I believe I'm working on this network design and install project. And you can see here, um, a sales executive is who is assigned to pre-sales engineer. Not making this confusing at all, of course. So that's how you can insert this very basic top level information. But what if you need to do a little bit more? This next item here, um, well, I say this next item, obviously, as you can see, we're still inserting information. And now we run into the next level of our um, inquiry here, which is going to bring up a little bit more complication. So as you see here, um, this particular uh, merge data is the first command here I'm seeing is locations, if any. So what in the world does that mean? And I can kind of see this whole thing here ends there, like if I can see locations end if. And this is where one of these concepts of flow control is going to come in. There's a couple of different principal methods of flow control, and we actually see them both playing out right here. So you can see locations if any, and then I've got to close that, locations end if. If you're used to much coding, you generally can probably appreciate that if I open something, I can close it. So what am I, what am I wanting to happen here? I am wanting to say if the project has any locations in it, in its merge data, then I want to print them. So how would I figure that out? Let's hop back to the network design and install. So as you can see here, pretty close to the top is this locations uh, key, right? Locations. But notice that's a little bit different. Under it, there's this expand button. 
pretty much anywhere you see this expand button means that uh, we're treating this locations um, key as an array. So in, uh, in database design, an array is just a collection of items. And so what I'm saying is, hey, I'm gonna put all of my locations as individual items in an array underneath uh, this locations key. And when I click expand, you can see I've got all of this information about uh, that particular location. We'll come back to arrays in a little bit um, as well when we get down to the actual listing of services. But for now, we can see, okay, this would be true if there are any locations. So this is another type of, uh, obvious, I say another type. This is one of, again, the principal types of flow control. And I can say, if any, meaning if there are any locations, please proceed. And so you notice what happens next. If there are any locations on this project, I'm saying, hey, I want to um, put this header in here. So if there are no locations on the project, I'm not even gonna print any of this and it will just skip this and move on to this executive summary, if any. The power in that is I can completely leave out sections of my document if there's no relevant information for those sections, which we think is a very helpful thing and handy thing to be able to do uh, to make your templates more flexible. So what happens next? The header gets printed, then I'm saying locations, locations, excuse me, each location. So this is a different type of flow control that's very powerful in which I'm saying, hey, I now that I know there are some locations in this project, I want to print the header and now I want to iterate through those locations. So in this case, there's only a single location in this project. So what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna say, okay, each location, I'm gonna do location.name. Now, one thing that I want to point out here that's really uh, another important concept is what I'm doing in my syntax here. So this first one, I was saying locations if any. Any is one of those universal questions that's available. There's a few others like um, uh, uh, that are available that we can go through in a little bit. This, however, locations, each location, what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, I want to iterate through all of the locations on this project. In this case, there's only the one. And then I want to call whatever one I'm currently working on my location. So it's a very small difference in an S there, but I'm saying, hey, I'm gonna handle one location at a time. And what do I wanna do? I want to print the location name followed by a colon, followed by the location dot address, which is exactly uh, these values here. So there's location dot name. In this case, it would print indigo strawberry HQ, then a colon, and then uh, 123 Main Street, any town, New York. And I would do that for all locations. Now in this, again, this particular project, there's only the one location. But that's gonna allow me the flexibility to not even have to know how many locations are gonna ultimately be in the project to create my document template. It's just going to go through these as a list. In this case, it's going to put each one of them as a, a hard return line here. If I wanted each of them to be a bullet point, I could format uh, this, I could put a bullet point right here and in that case, it would just continue to put bullet points until it ran out of locations. And that is another powerful feature of this type of merge field. It's gonna inherit the formatting applied to the merge field itself. That was also true up here, right? This project name is going to inherit this text styling. This uh, location name is going to be bold followed by the location address, which is not going to be bold. So, largely what's gonna happen through this section of the document is um, these sections are going to be included if there is relevant information. A lot of these next sections are coming from the uh, customer summary area of a project right here under customer success. As you can see, if I click on this area, really what I'm doing is I'm saying print the executive summary, solution summary, but notice here, um, 
our responsibilities has no value, customer responsibilities and out of scope has no value. So what's nice is I can say, hey, only print those headers if there are values and otherwise skip them, which is exactly what I am able to do here. So that's how to handle some of these very simple ones. We're now going to move into a bit more of uh, a complicated one, which is phases with tasks. Phases with tasks is the principal data object for inserting services um, for professional services into your project. So as you can see here, here are the uh four services uh, that are in this project and they're organized into these three phases. There's the one plan phase service, the one design phase service, and the one implement phase service. What we're going to do now is walk through how all of that information is going to get used here. So the first thing to note um, there's the scope of work in scope services, and the first thing is project management. And all I'm doing is saying the account name, which is um, who, whatever the account name is on this account, um, is going to get inserted there. And this is a boilerplate generic project management statement. So the next thing we begin with is the phases with tasks data object, which is going to account for all of uh, this uh, merge field structure. And so we're gonna walk through this line by line to help it make a little bit more sense. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hop back to um, the merge data view. And I bet you know what we're gonna do. We're gonna search for phases with tasks. So as you can see here, phases with tasks, here it is, and it is an array. In this case, it's an array that has three items under it. So the first thing I'm saying is phases with task each phase. So what I'm saying is, hey, I'm going to iterate through each of the items in the phases with tasks array, and I'm going to call it a phase for the purpose of how I'm going to talk about it next. You can see the next line says phase dot has tasks if. So if I come down to phase dot has tasks if, the first thing I'm gonna need to do is see, okay, what is this has tasks thing? This is what we call a logical test. And we have made a number of these available throughout the merge data branches here uh, to enable clients to do a lot of different creative things. In this particular case, the phase dot has tasks if will be true and will therefore proceed if the platform discerns that there are any uh, services inside of that particular phase. This is uh, another place where it's worth noting that the word task and uh, the word subtask, you may see scattered throughout the merge data. You may see words like features. I'm gonna correct what some of that is, um, but those are older terms for uh, items that we have since renamed. We have not necessarily updated the merge data because updating the merge data would of course break existing customers' documents. So there's a little bit of um, out of syncness there, which is why it's very helpful of course to walk through this with a live project. <clears throat> So as you can see, I've got phase dot has tasks if has tasks in this case is going to be true for all of these phases because all of these phases have tasks in them. Let's say I go back to my project here and I delete the uh, service here. Um, this project is in the approved state, so I'm going to really quickly uh, rescope it so I can edit it. Now I can come back here and delete, um, I'm gonna delete this planning service. <clears throat> so now if I refresh my merge data view, <coughs> if I expand out, you'll now see that my plan phase has no tasks in it, right? I deleted that one. So has tasks is now false, meaning it would skip everything that happens next. It would return false and therefore it would go up and say, okay, I'm gonna go on through my next phase. In this case, it would run into the design phase, which does have tasks. 
So this very simple logic is now going to guide us through the rest of what's going to happen here. And we can basically use this um, uh, merge data set here all the way down through um, phases with tests in each as a guide to find pieces of data. So the next thing that's going to happen is if the phase has tasks, I'm going to print the phase's name. So you see here phase dot phase. In this case, I have renamed the item that I'm currently handling as phase. And so I want to say phase dot phase, which is going to point me to this particular key, the value of which is design. So what would get printed here would say design phase. Or in the next instance, if has tasks is true, it would be implement phase. Phase dot tasks each task. So this is another one of these key things. I am now moving from working with phase to working with task. So if I come in here and look, plan again was false, come to the next one, design has tasks is true, printed the phase name. Now I want to do phase dot tasks each task. So I can come here and I can see there is one tasks, uh, one tasks array item, I should say, in this particular phase. When I expand that, I get a whole bunch of other information. So the next thing that's going to happen is an equal sign. And that's how I know, again, kind of like up here with phase, I'm going to print something. So I'm going to print task.name. So I can come through, scroll here, and there I see the task.name is network design session. So that's what's going to get printed there. The next thing that's going to happen is task.sentences each sentence, and then print the sentence and then task dot sentences end each. You will see this sentences um, item referred to a lot. And that is a old school scope stack way of referring to whatever the service description items or the out of scope items or any of these um, pieces of text are going to be as they relate to a service here or its subservice. Um, we haven't gotten down to subservices yet, but we will here in a moment. So for this purpose, I can click here um, on the um, service description. I can see there's service descriptions all the way down. So the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to print. We will facilitate a networking design session to include the following with a colon right here under the bolded service name. I can find that again by coming down to the bottom and finding the sentences array. Now, now that, now that I'm down here, I'm gonna point out a few things here because you see a lot of things that kind of look like sentences um, and then a lot of things that are a little different. So the item that I'm referring to right here, uh, simply as sentences, is um, this particular array. And as you can see, there's an item under that array that contains the we will facilitate a networking and design session to include the following. You also notice that right next to it here, you see formatted sentences. That is going to be usable, excuse me, usable if you are using markdown in your fields. Markdown is a little bit more of a complex thing that we're gonna come back to later, but for our purposes now, what you're going to principally be wanting to focus on is this sentences array unless you're using markdown. So what's happening next, of course, we've gone through and we've done task.sentences each sentence. And you notice then I've got to close that. I haven't spent a whole lot of time on closings yet, but you notice there's a little bit of a, what we would call camel case going on here. So I do each sentence and now I'm end lowercase e each. And you'll see that pattern repeat through um, the merge data sets, right? You can see it here. Um, there is a task dot, uh, phase dot has tasks end if, right? When I started that if, the I is lowercase. When I end the if, the I is uppercase. And that's just kind of, again, a syntax thing that flows in from uh, the Ruby on Rails uh, platform that our database is built on. So I've gone through task.sentences each sentence. I've printed the sentence. 
and I've tasked out sentences in each. The benefit of doing it this way is our platform will interpret a hard return as a new array item. So if you ever need to list multiple things, you can just simply put a hard return and there would then be two array items under sentences. Now, the next thing that's gonna happen is task.features if any. Now, the feature, as I mentioned earlier, is the old school name for a, oh, I say I mentioned it earlier, I don't think I have, and it's the old school name for a subservices. The, pretty much the only place you see it is in the features array here, and you notice that this particular service has three features that I can now expand. So when I expand the first one, task.features each subtask, you can see I'm gonna handle each subtask in a specific way here. I'm gonna print the subtask quantity, which is right here. I'm gonna print the subtask name, which is going to be a little further down here, the whiteboard session in this case. And then I'm gonna do another array. Now, notice I have yet to close any of these arrays because I've just been opening them up as I went, except for the sentences one, because I wanted to go back up to the task context. Context awareness is one of these big issues that comes up in these complicated documents because it can be very easy to forget where you're working and to try to go invoke a piece of data that's available at the task level while you're perhaps at the subtask sentence level or something like that, right? It's very important to kind of keep track of where you are and know that only the information available at this level is what you can invoke at this particular time. So I'm gonna do task.features each subtask, doing subtask.quantity and then subtask.name. Then I'm gonna do the subtask.sentences each sentence. And then I'm gonna print those sentences and I can find those by scrolling down to the bottom here and there I see it. Then I'm gonna start ending things. So first I'm gonna end my subtask sentences which closes out this one. Then I need to end my task.features each subtask because I'm done handling that. Now, what's important to know, again, I'm iterating through each of these. So in this particular case, there would be one, two, three of these uh, dark filled in bullet points followed by the individual, uh, in this case, service descriptions that is the sentence value under each of these. And then I'm just going to keep going uh, back up closing out end each, end if, end each, all the way until I am done with this last end each for the phases with task data object. And that's how you would then use this structure to output all of your service information into your document. The next thing that picks up, you notice, is this next data object, which is the language fields data object. And it works a little bit differently, but using all the same principles. When I say it works differently, it's structured differently. You can actually see that the data objects are right here next to each other. The language fields data objects, as the name would imply, corresponds to these language fields. In the project, you can see the language fields as out of scope, client responsibilities, key assumptions, and deliverables. If I wanna actually see where those are set up, I can go to settings, language fields, and then I can see the four language fields on my account. <clears throat> You'll see here what's labeled a service description is really going to become a slug that's available a little bit down uh, in a minute. So you notice this one is structured in much the same way, except instead of having the phase um, as the top level item, we're going to have the language name as the top level item. So I've got the four language fields of um, deliverables, uh, excuse me, out of scope here first, then we've got client responsibilities, then we've got key assumptions, and then we have deliverables. And so I'm saying, hey, first things first, I wanna print the language fields each language. Next, I'm going to, excuse me, that's not a print, that's a, an evoke, right? I'm switching data objects because I am done with faces with tasks and I'm now switching to language fields. Then I'm going to do equals language dot name. So again, I can come here to the first one and I can see the language dot name is gonna print my out of scope information next. 
Now is the really the first time we're seeing language dot formatted introduction. So good time as any to talk about Markdown. For all the full details about Markdown, I'm gonna again refer back to our help center because there's a lot more to Markdown than um, I'm probably gonna cover uh, in this little bit, but there is some basic Markdown syntax that we do support. One of the key things to keep in mind about Markdown is it is referencing the styles that are created in your Word document here in the style pane. And this kind of outlines these, right? So headline one, head on, it's heading one here. Headline two, heading two. Notice um, heading three, heading four. Four, which is yep right there so you can keep going all the way down to the number of headings but if you make a reference to a style and markdown that's not available in your word document the document generation will fail you notice you can also um, use bold text and italic text. One thing that's a little implicit here, if something isn't noted, it's going to use this normal style, which is if, you're, if you've are if you been in Word a while, that's just like if I'm typing something in a Word document, that is the default style in that Word document, right? So if you want to make um, changes to how strictly uh, unformatted text will flow in if you're using markdown um, and using the formatted um, text. Uh, in this case, I'm using formatted introduction. Um, you would have to make a change to the normal style of your document, which can have a lot of complicating factors. The other things that's worth noting is the list items in the list uh, uh, and then uh, if, if you wanna have numbered lists here or unnumbered lists. Um, you have to create some specific styles in your document called list bullet and list number. You can see that this particular document does have those styles created in them. Again, if those styles aren't present, the document will fail to generate. And you can create um, groupings of three spaces to denote deeper levels of that hierarchy. So one, two, three, six, if you wanna get down to this third level, right? You kinda get the idea. For what we're doing with formatted introduction here, we're much simpler than that. This formatted introduction is the introductory text um, for that language field as it's going to be defined here in the settings area, which just allows me to give again, as the name would imply, that introduction. I can also supply a conclusion if I want. In our document, we've not used the conclusion, but you can if you would like to. The next thing that's happening is I'm going to do language.phases each phase. So as you can see, if I come into the language field item here, the next thing that happens is uh, I've got these f this phase array down inside of the language field arrays, which kind of gets at the whole thing, right? Really, the language fields is saying that the top level array here is the individual language fields versus phases with tasks, the top level of the array are the phases in your project. So, much like we did before, I can just follow the logic. Language.phases each phase, phase.sentences if present, phase.sentences each sentence, and now I'm gonna print the sentence. In this case, the sentence has contextually changed. So in this case, right, there's no phase, there's no plan phase services, so I'm gonna go to the design, and I see there I do have a sentence present. If I expand what that sentence is, I'm going to see a network assessment is considered out of scope for this project. That's gonna be flowing in from, if I come down to my project and go to out of scope, that's coming in from right there. So one nice uh, thing to note here is if I ever see sentences at the phase level, what this is telling me is I'm not, uh, I, what I'm not do doing is drilling all the way down to the task level. I could, and that task level would also have that same sentence present. So why have I done it this way? What this allows us as the Scopestack platform to do is filter out duplicates. So if I ever see that sentence value at the phase level, what I'm saying is, hey, I don't want a bunch of duplicates. I only want, if, if, the, if another service in this project had this exact same out of scope uh, item denoted in the same phase, it would only show up here once versus if I listed it per 
task here per service, it would wind up listed twice, right? So that's the power of doing it this way. It also makes the merge fields much simpler, right? I don't have to dig down nearly as far. All I have to do is say, okay, if a sentence is present, then uh, come down to here and print um, the uh, sentences there. So let's note uh, another little grouping that's happening here that's I think worth pointing out. So all of this right here is basically predicated on the notion that language dot ha excuse me language um, dot has language if present. So what is that has language? Much like we had has tasks, has language here is only going to return true if there is language in that language field on this project. In this case. I know that out of scope has language, so it's going to proceed here, which is then where you would uh, get the rest of this information. However, if has language is blank, which is a good way of getting at false, it's actually going to just print this single bullet point. There is no specific whatever the language field's name is um, for this project. In this case, there are no specific out of scope items for this project. And then it would do um, language that has language end if to close that out. So that's another helpful little tip um, that you can do. Using blank and present or blank and any, um, you can denote um, all of the different scenarios that you may need to logically end the game out. We've covered the main principles of inserting phases with tasks and the language fields. The other big uh, data object that's super helpful when you're doing merge data is the project pricing one. This project pricing one um, has a lot of different information in it that can be evoked. So I can do project pricing dot total contract value, project pricing dot professional services dot any if right is a merge field that I could do I uh, have available and that's noticed because this isn't a raid in the sense that I have to iterate through each item these are just structured in such a way that um, it gives me a little um, clarity around um, what's happening here right these items are all at the top level project pricing dot whatever um, or I could do project pricing dot professional services dot any of these and I can keep evoking all the way down, right? So you'll see here there's a lot of different pricing objects um, invoked as you go through here um, through some of these payment tables and that's definitely worth exploring. The only other item that I'm going to spend a whole lot of time on here is again we're going to take one quick journey back to our formatted text would be how we've laid out the terms and conditions. So notice here I've done terms and condition each term and then I've done term.formatted content. If I go to terms and conditions, there it is. You see I've got one, two, three, four, five items in that array. And as you can see here, what I'm doing is I'm doing, okay, each one of these um, items in this array I'm going to print, um, but I'm going to do equals term.formatted content. The formatted content in this case is going to be this headline. In this case, it's limitation of liability, confidentiality, out of scope work, payment methods. These are just some sample terms, but I can come through here and just iterate through each of these. So I would get a heading of limitation of liability and then the normal text of that. Then I would go on to the next one and so on and so forth until all the terms were printed. And that is really the basics of merge data in Scopestack. As I said, there's a lot of complications you can have to this. There's a lot of logical tests. Um, e there are tons and tons of merge data items available here um, to the point where it's not going to be really um, worthwhile for me to go through all of them because really the easiest thing to do is to hold up your uh, merge data view to the source project and say, okay, I would expect to find this information here. Where do I find it? How do I navigate through it? And that's really the best way to kind of work through how to build a document template is to build a project in the way you think you're going to need to build it. Follow the merge data to try to get it to lay out um, as you would like, and then ultimately um, figure out what you need to do. 
as I mentioned earlier, um, we have a couple of um, different items available here. We make other templates available. So this is an example of a statement of work and managed services agreement, right? This one, as you can see, shares a lot of the common elements. But when I get down to the scope of work, I've got in scope services here. Then I'm going to lay out my phased work with phases with tasks. And then I'm going to come down into recurring services. And I'm going to move into this managed services data object, which has its own set of things going on, right? So this is another one of these items where there's a lot going on here um, for you to explore and to kind of see how we lay some of this out. I think that can be a very helpful way for you to understand how you can build your own documents. One of the other big things that's super helpful is the common merge field sets. This is the downloaded document. As you can see here, this just contains a lot of live merge fields that you can copy and paste out of this document into your document. Let's say you want to print out every contact in your project. You can do that right here through this full contact data object array. You can see there's the project uh, contact information, client contact information. Here's all these customer summaries fields. There's a lot of merge field examples through here that can give you a lot of different ideas about how to build things. So that way you don't have to start from scratch. We've got a lot of the same elements that are in some of our document templates, but we do have some different ones, right? We've got a lot of different tests and a lot of different pricing table examples. We've got a lot of things in here that I think can be very helpful to you. Of course, if you get lost, we're always here to help. You can always um, use the chat function right here in Intercom to send us a message and we would be glad to respond and hopefully get back to you about your specific question about merge data. Again, I'm Alex with Scopestack. It's been my pleasure to walk with uh, you uh, through all of this today. Hopefully you learned some things along the way. Let us know how we can be helpful and thanks for using Scopestack.